911 center they connected to. And for 12 and a half of my last 13 years, we were engaged in global combat operations, and I had up to 56,000 rounds somewhere in the world. At one point in time, they were in 19 different places in 11 countries, from Rome, Spain, Siganel, Italy, the Black Sea rotation, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and then we were doing uh, humanitarian relief in uh, Haiti and Pakistan. And then uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, and we had a Mew Marine Expeditionary Force that was heading back uh, just off the coast of uh, Morehead City. When, uh, when Sandy hit, we turned that Mew and we sent them up to New Jersey, and uh, they backed uh, the naval vessel backwards uh, into the harbor and uh, used its nuclear power plant to bring up uh, power, and uh, the Marines used our 911 center in a can to establish first responder comms. A third of the Marines get out or rotate every year, so a third of my entire base of people left. And new ones came in, or they left for nine months to two years. And I could not stay compliant. So we're here today to talk about the Internet of Things. The Navy was coming in doing what it does best, putting sensors and readers and RFID, ICS, and SCADA on everything. 42,000 buildings in Marine Corps installations each, 14,500 just at Camp Lejeune. For those of you that don't know Camp Lejeune, just up the road, I'm actually out of Sneech Ferry. Um, so this is the first time I've given a brief close to home. Uh, earlier this week I was in South Carolina. Uh, next week I'm in Arizona, the following week Texas, and then I'm in Budapest, uh, briefing NATO. So when we talk about the Internet of Things, when my children, both of them went to UNCW right here, <coughs> went to college, they had one laptop and a flip phone. My son's 33, my daughter's 30. <coughs> And now the average kid goes to college with five IP devices. Everything from Xboxes to tablets to tablets to phones to wireless printers to you name it, they're taking it with them to school and they all got IP addresses. Uh, part of my presentation that we're not going to be able to see, uh, I'll show you that my humidor, my, I'm a cigar smoker, my, my humidor is on the internet. I manage the humidity and the temperature in my humidor from where I am in the world. My wife's iRobot is on my phone. So when I'm traveling, I usually cut that thing on about 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> so don't y'all ever tell her that it's me doing <laughs> She thinks there's something wrong with it. I get to come home and go, I don't know, but I reset it, it's working fine. It works fine the whole time home, then I leave and I turn it on at 2 in the morning. Oh, there you go. So, awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, we don't want to do that. <laughs> That's my background. Um. <coughs> That's it. Put my magic touch on Christmas. Yeah, we got an IT person in the room. <laughs> Twelve and a half years I was engaged in combat ops. My SLA was 100%. Could not be now. <coughs> so in twelve and a half years as a, as a government employee, I took one day off. I was sick and in the hospital and they wouldn't let me out. And I fought. And uh, I took one day off. Didn't take a vacation. Didn't take a holiday. Uh, I was there on Christmas Eve. I was there on Christmas Day because uh, unfortunately in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, they don't stop just because it's a holiday. Not one of our holidays, anyway. Uh, February is always a pretty good month during uh, Ramadan. Uh, we, could, uh, we could go home in a, in a decent hour. 
but uh, it was a, it was a tough loss. It really was. I, I wore my staff flat out for 12 and a half years because not only were they doing all of this basic garrison IT support and 178,000 phones in 44 medical and dental facilities and nine runways and 15 alternate runways and uh, just all the stuff that goes with running a city and then you got eight of them in different states and every state's got different laws and then the Navy's putting in all this ICS and SCADA stuff my logistics folks are putting RFID everywhere and they got wireless readers everywhere the police department, our PMO, were putting wireless IP-based cameras and license plate reading systems and all their police cars and all of our first responder vehicles. They even got wave runners with the fire department with, with hoses on. I think they just like going out there and you know having water wars. But all that stuff was connected to our network. And we didn't know it. We had no idea that stuff was connected to our network. This. The largest threat to your network is your endpoints. We call it the loosen up between the keyboard and the seat back. <laughs> if they would give you a big enough wrench, you could tighten up some of them nuts. But that has a tendency to cause more issues because they are the only reason that you have a network. Is there a patch for stupid? Why somebody that looks like me can read an email and say, I am related to the deposed king of Ethiopia, and I have won the lottery. And if I click here, it'll walk me through the steps on how I can get my money as a deposed king from Ethiopia. If you've ever met an Ethiopian, they don't look like me. They're usually a lot thinner. My cybersecurity resources, I got 16 Marines, civilians, and contractors that, uh, that were doing nothing but basic cybersecurity patching. Get a patch, install a patch, on 150,000 boxes, and then go out and manually touch the 20,000 boxes that it didn't patch. And then get another patch. Well, we started getting 410 to 420 patches a year, and there's only 208 work days. If you do the math, you don't have enough staff. And you can't keep up. We couldn't say more than 60, 65% required. Significant number of compromises have proven to be two year old vulnerabilities. Well, I don't know who named this latest virus, but want to cry. But do y'all know when the patch came out for that? March of this year. The game's changing now. It's not a two-year-old vulnerability, it's a two-month-old vulnerability. The game is starting to change. They got the script kiddies and the hackers got better tools. So I tell people all the time this story. If you went to the mall and you left your iPod in the front seat of your car with the windows down, about halfway through your mall experience, you'd be thinking, I need to go by the Apple store to go get a new iPod. But if you locked up your windows, rolled up your windows and locked your doors, about halfway through your mall experience, you'd be thinking, I left the thing on the front seat. Not as pleasant an experience. But if you put in a trunk, Roll up your windows, lock your door, set your car along. You'd have enjoyed your mall experience without even thinking about it. That's what we're trying to get through to everybody is how to automate that process. My last project before I retired from civil service was to do a program called Comply to Connect. In the civilian market, it, it, uh, DHS called it uh, CDM, Continued Di Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation. And they put billions against this program, and Comply to Connect uh, is now in the National Defense Authorization Act as a law, mandatory for all the federal agencies. So I took a team of really smart people right here in North Carolina, uh, a lot of them uh, from all over the state here, and, uh, and we designed a program that automates all that baseline fundamental crap. Because the people patching your network and, and scanning your network they get bored with it. 
It's the same thing every day. Scan, patch, scan, patch, scan, patch. Oh my God, we got a vulnerability. Scan, patch, patch. <laughs> Run out and touch a box. Needed to automate all that. So, as managers, supervisors, leaders, and people in our business, we spend a lot of time wrestling a little bit of alligators. We spend all day playing whack-a-mole. Well, we should be hunting pregnant alligators. So we don't have as many alligators in our pond. A whole lot easier if you can take 90 days, and I, this is one of the things I did, is I took 90 days, I brought all my principal staff in, I sat them down and said, I need to run the place for 90 days. Make decisions, good, bad, or indifferent, but unless, it's, unless the general is mad, run the place for 90 days. I need to spend 90 days doing a strategic plan and a way to get ahead of the power curve because we are spending every day being reactive and we cannot do this. <coughs> we are not going to be able to do this. Well, I can't get budgets done. I can't get manpower stuff done. I need to focus on how do we get ahead of these alligators. They gave me the 90 days. It was fantastic. I came out with a document that's actually publicly releasable. These are industry stats. It is expensive if you get compromised. It is really expensive. And it just tears up your resources. And what does that do? It puts you further behind. Now you're not playing whack-a-mole. You're, you're not even in the hunting grounds anymore. Your business and mission impact. In my case, my biggest fear was that a unit from here, right here in you know, Tumaf, would call me from Afghanistan needing to do a medevac and they didn't have comms. A lot of people don't know, but Camp Lejeune is the step site. It's the international step site for the Marine Corps. Everybody in the Marine Corps that deploys reaches back uh, via KUKA or however we get back to Camp Lejeune to what we call a step site. It is the number one data center in the Marine Corps for deployed forces. It's it. It's the hub. My biggest fear was a unit trying to call me with somebody's kid, husband, father, brother, sister, mother, aunt, uncle, that needed help. And our network was done. So I, I was a little tough on my staff, turned my hair white, wore out my staff. I had a 2% turnover rate in five years. When I retired 18 months ago, uh, they have now hit a 27% turnover rate. Uh, a lot of folks followed me out retired. They, uh, they, they were exhausted, but, uh, but they can spend the rest of their life knowing that we never went down. So your desired state is complete visibility. If you don't know what's out there, you can't, you can't protect it, and you can't make a risk assessment of it. And that's where this IoT stuff is really starting to kick. Uh, you know, everything from stoplights, to trash cans. I mean, I've been all over the country and now I'm all over the world. And I'm looking at some of these smart cities and some of the things that are going on. And it's not just the, you know, the person who's too lazy to walk down your multifunction device anymore and puts a printer on their desk. It's actually the dipsy dumpsters are on the internet and they're on your network. Less than six weeks ago, a major college university up in, uh, in Virginia was compromised and their entire university network went down for 15 minutes every hour. It was in the news and, and then it was, you know, kind of went away because the college and university uh, were wants to remain kind of anonymous about it, but it was a big deal. It was huge. It took them a day and a half to fix that. You know what it was? Pepsi machine. The vendor machines, they, when they put those machines in, they try to tap into your network. If they can't get into your network, they go cellular. But if they can get onto your network, wireless, they do that. The hacker went in through a Pepsi machine, got into the LED lighting system that ran the university. From there, it went sideways, laterally, and did a denial of service attack on the DNS for 15 minutes every hour. It flooded the DNS with searches for Chinese restaurants. Brought the entire university network down for 15 minutes every hour. That's what's happening out there. 
I, I was out in California, Sacramento, the, their dumpsters are on the, on the network. Not just the parking meters and stuff. They're dumpsters. They know when they're full, they know when they don't get used, and they know they've got heat sensors in them, so they know when, uh, when they've been there too long and, they, and what's in there is fermenting. Or if somebody's moved into them. Nobody actually just gets up in the morning and drives a route anymore. You know, it used to be the Pepsi guy would get up in the morning and drive a route and he'd go fill all the machines and at the end then he go on. Now he gets it on his smartphone, which machines are out of what. Before he gets off the truck, he knows what he's bringing in. He knows what sells and what doesn't sell. All that stuff is the Internet of Things. It is everywhere. My daughter lives down here. She's a surgical nurse at one of the local veterinary services. And uh, I can go into my refrigerator at midnight and grab some ice cream, and she'll send me a text. Dad, you shouldn't eat that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you already fat. <laughs> right, baby, get out of my refrigerator. <laughs> Ground it. So I'm thirty. Here. So we did this comply to connect program, CD animal steroids. When a device attempts to connect to your network and grab an IP, before it can pass a single packet of data, drop it into a secure VLAN. Do a risk and health assessment. Is this device authorized on our network? Who is on this device? Is that person allowed on this network? Is this the right network? Because y'all are taxpayers, and for every time somebody put a classified workstation on an unclassed network, it's $12,500. I spent about two and a half million dollars a year just on those spillages until we did this. And then I spent nothing. It does a complete health and hygiene assessment of the computer. When was his last antivirus, anti-malware updates? When was his last scam? Was it was in within your window? Ours was 72 hours. If not, kick one off. Is it talking to the HBSS and EPO box? Is it talking to the right HBSS and EPO? Are all the agents running on it? Is it patched to compliance? Are all the Cat 1 vulnerabilities patched? If not, patch it. Do all that stuff and then give the user a login screen. Or if it could not be patched and become an unacceptable risk, give the user a pop up, cut a ticket in the change management database system, service now or remedy, notify the right people. And, uh, and send somebody out to, to fix the box. If a box didn't take a patch three times in six months, send a note to the refresh re-image team. Cut a ticket. If it was due for refresh, put it in the front of the list. If it wasn't, put the front of the list for, for re-image, because the third time you touched it, you just spent more manpower touching that box than it cost to re-image it. And that young 19-year-old that you just snatched out of high school that was working at McDonald's that's running around doing patches, he loves going into that office every week, seeing that pretty secretary and patching her box because he gets paid whether he does it or not. And he's certainly not going to tell anybody, hey, you know, I patch that box every week. He's going to go, I got a great job. <laughs> We automated the entire process, and it had to be done within 42 seconds. It worked. So, before we, before we get to all this, this corporate nonsense, because this is not a sales pitch, I'm actually not on the sales team. I'm the strategist for the company. I brought in a big five, all the NAC vendors. I said, look, I need to find everything on my network. And I had a, a network discovery tool that you guys paid $15 million for. I really apologize for wasting your money. And I had two NACs on my network. And then we brought in every, all the other vendors, and I'd never heard of Forescout, never even heard of it. And then walks in this guy named Chad Kiefer, who's your former Marine, uh, with uh, Niels Jensen, who's uh, a great Dane. Uh, he's actually from Denmark. He's looking on the deck. He's, he's as batshit crazy as all the Marines on there. And they said, hey, let us try. Just let us put our stuff on your network while you're doing this bake off. I said, what in the world are you after? I made some jokes about four scouts. We let them come in there. Four hours, they installed their box. The next morning, they found 6,000 things on my network that none of the other five vendors found. 
including a $15 million network discovery tool that y'all paid for. That I'll let you know I didn't pay for after that. It found everything touching the fabric. And I found so much stuff on the network. I found a young corporal from 2nd Marine Division had plugged in a terabyte hard drive. 10,000 copyright infringements on federal property. That's a felony. That's a million dollar fine to the government. Fortunately, Sony was fighting other fish at that time, and they uh, decided to, since I self-reported, that they would let give us a break. But they didn't keep the lawyers and the generals and NCIS and everybody from coming down and, uh, and beating me up for not knowing it was there. Everything touching the fabric, wired, wireless, RFID, cellular, doesn't matter. We got an IP, we knew about it. First time in my entire life as an IT guy that I could say I knew everything on the network. And it gave me the, what is, for a cyber guy, and I was a security guy before I came a CIO, the holy grail. It gave me an alias tape. It gave me a username. It gave me an IP. It gave me a MAC address. It gave me a machine name. It gave me a switch, and it gave me a port. It gave me a room number and a jack on the wall. And you go out there trying to surf YouTube and learn how to do wheelie stands on your motorcycle on my government network now, I could go in your office and catch you. Or I could just call you on the phone and go, hey, you want to shut that down? We don't do business with eBay and the government, so why are you on eBay? As you know I'm on eBay, why are you doing, what you on my computer for? Did you not read that this is government property screen that you log into with that cat? We watch everything. So we went from 60% compliance to what is amazing. These are all our corporate logo stuff. Yeah, you see all this good stuff. These are all the IT. You get all this stuff? 30 billion of these things are going to be here by 2020. I think we're getting a whole lot closer to that in about 2018. Your service back here. Okay. God, how many of these corporate ones are put in here? Now we're back to the real stuff. You can't see it, you can't make a risk assessment. Sort of like your kids, when they go in behind the closed doors in the room and they get quiet, you know they're doing something wrong. Yeah, I got dogs, uh, Jar Jar Binks and Princess Leia. <laughs> Binks is a whippet, if you've ever seen a whippet, he's certainly in long floppy ears and just dumb as a brick. Couldn't be more lovable though. When they get quiet, they're eating something they shouldn't. They're chewing up something they shouldn't be. I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely amazing. They're like little kids. The rest of the time, they're just as noisy as they can be. No agent. The thing that, that really surprised me, and the reason I ended up when I retired going to the guy, no agent. In fact, they go around and fix everybody else's agent. One of the other vendors doing the bake off asked us to use Forescout to make sure their agent was running in the proper configuration on all the machines for the bake off. And I was like, yeah, it's not. The whole idea of a bank off was so that you can prove your brother. Thanks for proving theirs. It does control. Integrates all these stovepipe tools because your NAC is separate from your firewall, separate from your Palo Alto, your Archer, your RSA. Well, all these all these tools are all stovepipe. It ties everybody together, including your change management that database and your. Uh, and your, uh, your configuration management database and your ticketing system. So you can do some analytics. We're going to see some of those here, but orchestrate. That's it. It can make decisions. You can say, okay, if it's a kernel or if it's a 911 center or if it's a, a general or if it's somebody who's, we call them alligators, you can put scars on your arse. If it's somebody that you really shouldn't take off a network, even if they're doing something stupid, don't take them off notify somebody in a position of authority that can go and, and handle that politically. But if it's, you know, if it's you know, just a regular user and they're doing something stupid, take them off and out. You can do everything from notification to actually drop the denial service. There we go. So what ended up happening? I took 16 GS-12s, 
and, uh, and a couple of Marines and a couple of contractors and, uh, and cut it down to four people that were running uh, the next year. And they no longer went around and were patching stuff. We went from a 60% compliance to a 99% compliance. If you Google Compliant and Connect, about the fourth article down, you'll see the CISO for the entire Marine Corps say, I was on this, uh, I, I built a website called NARC, Network Assessment Reporting Compliance. We had to be geek nerd, I like NARC. He said, I went out there and found two thirds of the Marine Corps was 100% compliance. We were 100% compliance for four hours. Unbelievable. How do you get 100% compliance? And for four hours. No. 99% could be your, uh, your standard. So what did I do with the other 12 people? Well, I had a mandatory, uh, I had to get rid of four billets, so four people retired and moved on to other jobs. And then the other eight went into proactive stuff. We went into the alligator hunting. I sent them to CEH school, uh, CISM, GLSC, CISSB, and then sent them to NSA level one, two, and three, and they went into the proactive world. They went into the hunt. And uh, no longer were they running around doing patching and scanning. Now they were squirrels. They love squirrels. Hate sales guys. Sales guys hump your leg, reach your pocket, take your money. That's what they do. <laughs> Every other Thursday. We call it leg on Thursday. My poor secretary, she we had a rule. If they wore a tie, don't let them in. I can buy a car from each, you know, from, from somebody out there in Jacksonville. After 15 minutes, walk in and say that you had something you needed to see me about. If I said, no thanks, that meant I was interested. If I said, okay, the staff dealt with the, the vendor and I was done. Second third order impact. Asset license and portfolio management. Something I had never thought about being a second third order impact of having a, a network access control device was it did asset management. It tells you the date and service, date of manufacture, how many days it's been used, how many times an application's been used. So you guys are paying for a thousand Adobe Acrobat Pro licenses, $268,000 a year. Only reason that we had it was so that my civilian supervisors could do performance appraisals on civilians. And by law, they were required to be digitally signed using Adobe Acrobat Pro. Horse guy came in and told me I never had more than 90 in use at one time. Used all thousand. But for five years, I paid $268,000 a year for two performance appraisals a year, two signatures a year. The Adobe guy walks in my office in September. He's a vendor. He's going to hunt my leg, reach my pocket, and take his $268,000. I said, I don't think so. But here's the numbers. Taxpayers aren't going to pay that. I'm not going to pay that. I'm going to find another way. If I got to put a kiosk in a building and have everybody go use it to do their performance appraisal, I'll do that. But I'm never going to pay this kind of money again for this. They said, well, let's stand up a life cycle server, put on 200 floating licenses, run you about 35000 a year. Like, Why didn't you tell me that five years ago? You were giving me 260 k One app, put a quarter million dollars back in the taxpayer money. All right, so that kind of ends what I had to talk about. I got about five minutes, I'm going to show you some stuff. Not that. That. That was our pilot. This is the NARC set. So if you look up here, you'll see that. Uh, we tested it on 1,125 machines, and uh, 24 hours later, they were 99.64% compliant. And then over here on the list tells you how many computers were left that weren't patched with that patch. And those are the patches. And we used the patches that were up to date in that one, 217 patches. So I saw this, and it's a whole crap. Set it up to headquarters, Marine Corps, and OSD, and said, I want you to put it on your next, on your whole network, right there at Lejeune, and see what you got. There's 26,000 hosts 
99.165% compliant. Here's all the bases and stations. You gotta run through each one of them and pull them all down. Every one of them is 99% compliant. When we talk about IoT, you talk about what's the risk to your network. It's a great risk. You now, you don't know where this stuff is made. Uh, when you hire a contractor to come in, we had Johnson Controls and a couple other people come in and do stuff. You just don't know who's doing what on your network. And if they run out of uh, government approved wireless access points, what are they going to do? They're going to go to Walmart. And they're going to put something on your network that could bring your network down. And all of you uh, are in a position where that's a bad idea. You know, when you think about how much money you lose, the risk of life and limb, the stuff that, that could possibly cause you to lose not only your job, but your reputation, uh, but more importantly, what if you, what if you hurt somebody? What if, what if something didn't work? Um, what if somebody like me decided to turn all the street lights at 4 o'clock in the afternoon green for five minutes? It'd take two days to get out of here. There are malicious people out there, and that's, that's what they do. And this latest attack really proves it. Um, we're very proud to say, in fact, there's a company knows out there that you know, we're in 60 countries and over 2,300 organizations. Not a single one of them is impacted. Because it does that risk assessment and analysis every time somebody touches the network. It comes on. So the IoT isn't coming. It's here. It's everywhere. And it's going to get significantly bigger. Everything fit bits to my car. I, my car is out in the parking lot, uh, is on the internet. I can literally drive up a road uh, and, and be part of a, a video teleconference. Not the safest or brightest thing I've ever done. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a Marine. We're, we're not all that right to start with. There's a, there's a great risk, uh, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and if you can't find what's touching the network, it's your, it's your blind spot. And if you turn your eye away from it, it'll, it'll bite you. It, it is an alligator that has really ugly teeth. So that's, uh, that's the spiel, that's, the, uh, that's what IoT is, and, and that's what we did um, to protect uh, folks here. Now, I can't tell you how honored I am to, to be at home. Um, I'm, I'm right here at Sneeze Ferry uh, to be able to talk to you all today. And uh, all of you that work for the state, you, you don't get paid anywhere near what your civilian commercial counterparts get paid. So we all know you're not doing it for the money, you're doing it because you're giving something back, which is you know the biggest honor that you can possibly do. And we we every resident should tell you every day. Uh, it, you know, I go below and they appreciate your service. No, we, we appreciate your work. I wouldn't have water, uh, I wouldn't have power, I wouldn't have sewer, I wouldn't have police, I wouldn't have all the things in the road. This is a fantastic state to live in is because of folks like you that are sacrificing every day for people like us. Thanks again. Appreciate your time today.